Alright, so enough about us and me. So today we're <coughs> going to talk about two of the most famous text mining papers in accounting literature. And one is by Feng Li. And that's the first one we'll talk about. Hopefully you guys read it. And he actually came to Rutgers a couple of years ago to present some of his research back when he was still at the University of Michigan. But apparently now he has a job in China. And I don't know the names of the Chinese universities, but it's a good one. All right. And then we'll either do an in-class exercise as kind of a break before we talk about the Laffer and McDonald paper. Or yeah, we can we might go out of order is what I'm saying. Which is fine. Okay. So the name of this paper is the information content of forward-looking statements in corporate filings, a naive Bayesian machine learning approach. Huh. So forward-looking statement. Information content. Interesting. So my question is like, well, what's a forward-looking statement? And if you guys read the paper, you already know. So let's find out. Here is the abstract, and we're not going to read it. But let's read the first part. This paper examines the information content of the forward-looking statements in the management discussion and analysis section of the 10K and 10Q filings using, using naive Bayesian machine learning algorithm. So what's the 10K? You guys should know this by now. What's the 10K? The annual report. And what's the MD in it? I mean, I see, you can see what it's called here, the management discussion and analysis section, but what's in that? What's, why, is, why is this the most read section uh, the 10K. That's the area where management provides a discussion of like the future prospects of the company. Yeah, that's true. So they talk about the future, and that's important because, well, investors want to know what's going to happen in the future. And this is the section where they have some protections too, that where management can forecast the future, but if they're wrong, then they're, they can't be held liable for it necessarily. What are those laws called? The safe harbor? Yeah, so these safe harbor laws and provisions that allow management to speculate about the future, to help investors know how to handle their money, right? Um, so they won't be held liable when they're wrong about the future. That's good. So I'm going to go over why the paper is important, what the problem being solved is, and what the contributions of the paper are towards solving the problem. Okay, so what is the problem being solved? So this is what we were just talking about. According to the SEC, one of the goals of the MDNA is to make public information about predictable future events, okay? But researchers, and, and uh, this is still very much true today, have not come to a conclusion whether or not this is actually happening. So one of the purposes of this paper is to figure out if there is informativeness to the MDNA. So, um, oh, I already forgot your name. Yeah. Selena. Selena. Why would the MDNA be informative? Let's see. Because it's given by an insider of the company. Okay, it's provided by management. Anyone else? This comes straight out of the paper. Sorry. Why else would an MDNA be? Is that the first thing? Well, that's not why it would be. So I 
think we've already mentioned these then. That we have the safe harbor provisions, it comes from management, and also we hope it's informative because it is the most read and important component of the 10K. So why would it not be informative? Well, maybe companies feel like there are proprietary costs associated with disclosing information. Maybe the interpretations of the safe harbor provision are not friendly enough so that they feel like they can just say anything they want about the future. And, you know, the MDNA isn't actually audited. So, which makes sense, but also calls it to just question maybe the accuracy of the MDNA. And there are criticisms about the MDNA that it contains boilerplate information. It doesn't change much from one year to the next. So the informativeness of the MDNA is really called into question. And of course, companies are very good at describing the past and poor at predicting the future, relatively. So how are we going to solve this problem? So what happens is Professor Lee is going to look at the tone of the forward-looking statements found in the MDNA regarding and see if there's any information regarding future profitability and liquidity of the company. He also investigates if this information content changes after Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, what are the economic determinants of tone, and what are the implications of the MDNA tone for the accrual anomaly. So what are we, when we say tone of the MDNA, what's, what's he talking about? Uh, The question is, what does tone refer to? What is tone? Okay, I mean, it's a major, it's yeah, what the paper's about. Attitude right? about, attitude about the content of the financial statement. Yeah, the attitude, or positive or negative about the content. Yeah, so positive or negative attitude found in the text, right? Yeah, yeah. So how would you go about measuring tone? What do you think is a good way? In this paper, it seems like you use some words, okay. Indicate a positive attitude or negative attitude in this paper, such as bad or good or some words like that. So, is that what they do in this paper? Do they look at the individual words to determine if something's. Do they have a list of good and bad words in this paper? Remember, Lou? Remember how they determine tone in this paper? What's that? Depending on the different words the manager uses in this program. Yeah, it, it definitely depends on the words the manager uses. Yeah. I think they look at frequency of certain words within a certain sentence. But is the is the list of words defined or not defined? No, it's not defined. Yeah, it's not defined in this paper. So we'll get into how they exactly do it. But how would you do it? So you would look for lists of good words and bad words, right? Yeah, it seems like that. That seems a good way to do it. I agree. Oh, no, not good way, but just a, it's an easy, simple way. Yeah, easy way to do it. Okay. You're right. It may not be a good way. I, I agree. I think that's a great way. Any other ways to do it? How would you determine the tone? So you can have a list of positive and negative words, uncertain words. Yeah. Okay, this goes to the next paper. All right. So... We will talk about how they did it in this paper. So what are the contributions of this paper? They analyze financial disclosures using a statistical learning method, made based. So first paper, do that. They also conduct a large sample study on forward-looking statements. And they improve on small sample studies that use human coders and find that the MDNAs are informative with regard to future performance. So, my question for you guys is, how would you, 
how would you find forward-looking statements? How did how did he go about and find forward-looking statements? So we, I asked you about tone. Like you'd count the number of negative words. That's one way to do it. But how would you find a forward-looking statement? Would you look for the future tense word? You know, when verbs are in the future tense? No, because in English there is no way to conjugate a verb into the future tense. I don't know what it is in uh, Chinese or uh, anyone here, you know, maybe know Hindi or something. No? No. Maybe you're raised here in the US. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe you know, what, what language do you speak? Arabic. Is there a verb conjugation in Arabic? Is there a future tense verb conjugation? I don't know. But I know in these uh, romantic languages, like the Latin languages, like Spanish and French and Italian and Portuguese, yeah, you can take a verb and conjugate it into a future tense. It's so easy to count verb words that are in the future tense, and, it's, and these are basically forward-looking statements, you know, statements about the future, right? So in one of those languages, it would be easy to find a forward-looking statement. You just count the statement, count the, find the sentences with future tense verbs. But in English, mm -hmm. there's like helper, what do they, they call them, helper verbs or helper words or something like that to indicate that a, that a sentence is in the future tense. So what Lee did is he came up with a whole list of future tense words and he said, if there is a sentence that has one of these words, then it's a forward-looking statement. This is a sentence talking about the future. So that's what he did. So let's see, I think that that's next. That's not next. Well, I'm gonna go to that slide since I was just talking about it. <laughs> wow, this is way too quick. Okay, so here's what Lee did. He said, if a sentence has one of these words, it's forward looking. Now, is this perfect? Can you guys see any flaws or come up with any examples off the top of your head? Like uh, maybe a, think of a sentence that uses one of these words that's not talking about the future. Yeah. Sure, so give me an example. I could give you an example. That's kind of forward looking. Isn't it? No, I, I can, could. I can. Oh, I can give you an example. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, that's right. That's right. So it's in, these words are not always used to talk about the future. You could say. Even me. What? Even me. Me. Okay. So. There's sort of a future-oriented kind of a feeling <laughs> to, to some of these words. Like, you know, we may experience a loss. Um, yeah, it's kind of talking about the future, definitely. Well, it it may be because of the That's right. So you can say, our loss may have been caused. So how would you... Okay, this is great. So I want you guys to think like I do, right? Which is not very hard, okay? So don't, don't get intimidated. So if you think of this sentence you just came up with, our losses may have been caused by extreme competition. Okay, so this paper would have called that a forward-looking statement, right? So what can we do differently you don't know how, I don't want you to know how to do it. I'm just thinking about it. What would you do to make sure that wasn't actually a forward looking statement? Rock, paper, scissors, I don't care. <laughs> okay, okay. So, more like should comply with should have or more have or have to have, just delay the combined sentence. Uh -huh. May have so the word have maybe indicates that yeah indicates that it's not talking about 
the future. It's probably talking about the past. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Like, you like the proximity of something within three or four words that have okay. an, an ED or something like that. Uh -huh. Yeah. So you're saying look for a past tense verb After, yeah. or a, a past. Yeah. I don't know all of my grammar terms. Since I'm being recorded, I'm not going to guess. <laughs> all right. Uh, but that's absolutely right. Okay. So you're right. So looking for the word with. Uh, and having another word in the same sentence, you know, to improve your algorithm. Uh, but, you know, you can't really conjugate verbs into the future, but you can conjugate verbs into the past, okay? Like you were saying, verbs with an ED. So one thing you can do is look for past tense verbs in a sentence and give that maybe priority over the existence of one of these words. So there are what are called part of speech taggers. So Andrea, you're into text mining now, or you might be, you're getting into it. And Yan, you're getting into it, right? So you should know that there are, you can write a program that will determine the part of speech of every word in a sentence. Part of speech could be noun, adjective, verb, and for the verbs, it'll tell you if it's past tense, present tense, okay? So one thing we could do to improve this algorithm is to use a part of speech tagger along with this list of words. All right, so let's go back. Professor? Yes? I, I don't think I follow what you all said about part of speech. Could okay. you give an example? Sure. So let's say we have this sentence we were talking about. Uh, it may have been caused uh, by competition. Okay. So the point is here, the word may does not make this a forward-looking statement, right? So, part of speech tagging looks at each individual word and gives it a part of speech. So, what part of speech is the word it in this case? Okay, this is, you know, I think those who are studying English as a second language should, should, should do best on this part of the class because you probably studied grammar more recently than any of the rest of us. Or a third language, I don't know. Anyone who's studying English. So, Lou, what, what part of speech would the word it be? It refers to uh, something. That's right? Yeah. Yeah, so what is it? It may have it's something you, that they also mentioned before. Yeah, you know. Later in I'm, I'm just going to guess, and I'm putting myself out there on, on video, I'm not a grammarian, but it seems like it's some sort of a pronoun, right? Um, like yeah. it's taking the place of another, yeah. the noun that it's yeah. referring to. So I don't know what pronouns are called, it, you know, I don't know how they're labeled in the part of speech tagger, I have no idea. But let's say it's like PN, okay, just making this up. Okay, then there's the word may. Gosh. Okay, we're not going to even go through all of these. And this is some sort of part of speech, right? And this one has a part of speech. Okay. Okay, so what we're doing... Ah, competition. I know that's a noun. That's usually one I use. Okay, all right. So what we're doing is... And what the part of speech tag does is it just assigns a part of speech to every uh, every word in the sentence, okay? And this, you know, may have been caused, this is some sort of, uh, uh, I don't know, past participle maybe? Anyway, 
but you can tell that it's in the past tense, right? And um, this is a way of also using a passive voice. So something may have been caused there. I also looked at it. Uh, I also think that's an interesting thing to measure. But do you understand the idea now? Yeah. Now, part of speech tigers are funny. Um, they can work in different ways. So the one I use uh, compares these words to uh, some documents that have already been manually tagged. Okay? So someone went through, let's say, the Wall Street Journal, or a team of people, mostly students probably, and they manually tagged each word as a noun, verb, adjective, adverb, etc. And you don't, you know, you won't be able, you can't believe how many different parts of speech that there are, you know. It could be 30 to maybe 80 or 100, depending on the part of speech tagger you're looking at. So anyway, what the part of speech tagger will do is it'll say, one way you can do it, and say, hey, well, let's look at this word here. Let's say 95% of the time, it's a pronoun when people manually tag it. So our part of speech tagger is going to just call it a pronoun. Because 95% of the time, you'll be right. OK? And here, um, let's say 60% of the time, it's an adverb or something. So we'll call it an adverb. So that's how the part of speech taggers work. They, they look at a manually coded corpus, manually coded words, and they compare the new sentence to what people have done manually. Now, uh, what would be a better way of doing it than perhaps a better way than just looking at each individual word? Yeah, so you can look at combinations of words. So instead of saying, you know, it is 95% of the time it's a pronoun, what if you look for it may? Or even it may have. Okay? And you can find examples in the actual text where it says it may have, and you can then get a maybe a more accurate part of speech tagger. Okay. Now the part of speech tagger I use, what it does is it looks at three words at a time and it tags them. But maybe there's no example of it may have in the manually coded text. So what it does is then it goes back and it just looks at two words together and see if that occurs. And if not, then it looks for one word. And if you can't even find that word, like maybe it's you know some strange new word or some a name or something like that. If you can't even find the word, it just says it's a noun. Because that's the most common, maybe the most common part of speech. Okay. Anyway, since this is a research seminar on text mining, you know, this is a very fundamental technique that is used out there. And it's very informative. So if you guys want to do some text mining research and you want to look at the parts of speech for some reason, then I can help you with the code to do that. It's, so don't be intimidated by it, okay? Even you undergrads. Are you undergrads? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I don't know. I'll have to teach these students. All right, okay. Great. So, six years later, we found a better way than Feng Li did for identifying forward-looking statements. Now, where did I put my All right, let's go back. So one interesting part of this paper is Feng Li hypothesizes what are the determinants of tone in the mDNA. So what would make 
DMDNA is very negative or very positive. And he goes through, and I don't know if you guys remember this list, and guesses or looks at past research or reasons out why the tone might be more positive or negative. So the first thing he looks at is current for performance. So do you guys remember, or do you guys have a guess how this would affect the tone of the MDNA? Would there be a positive relationship or a negative relationship? So positive relationship means if performance is good, then the tone should be good, right? Or if it's performance is bad, the tone should, should be bad. So what was uh, Feng Li's hypothesis? Do you remember? You can look at it. It's on page 1055. Positive. Positive. So why would the tone be positive? Well, because things are going well, so they're going to have a positive tone. But actually, also the result is positive, but I don't trust it. Oh, you don't trust the results? Uh, because it's Mercer. Because we don't know who affected who. Because uh, in this sample, in this example, we use uh, the early one. Right? The early pretty. The early is positive with the current performance. Right? Mm -hmm. Other than well, we'll get to the results. What page are you on there? Oh, you're, you're, you're past. Okay. okay. So in the hypothesis, he says, um, that, what? Did you guys, I don't want to read it to you. You guys. I still don't believe it. You still don't believe it? Yeah. Okay. Because maybe some indulgent dirt problem here. Maybe something what? Indulgent dirt. Uh huh? Yeah, so. Even if it is positive according to a result, but uh, I don't think it is because it could affect each other. So yeah. the result is not robust. I think. Just think. Okay, well, good. I mean, be critical. That's yeah. good. But is there, what about his other prediction? I mean, he, he, he waffles here. He says it could be positive or negative. So why could, why could the, why could there be a negative relationship? forms want to be upbeat, yeah. give a good impression. He also says that for firms with good performance, they may have more litigation concern. I don't know why they'd have more litigation concern. But they could be, that could cause them to be cautious in discussing future events, right? So just this idea of being conservative, not overpromising. I don't. I suppose that could affect good performing for firms more. All right. So plus minus means he gives an argument for a positive relationship and a negative relationship between current between this and tone. Okay. So about accruals, so high accruals, you would expect negative tone or positive tone? Yeah, I mean, he says negative, but then he says, well, if there are higher than normal accruals and the management knows this is a bad thing, then they may try to hide it by being positive. Okay. <laughs> All right, so positive or negative. This is the, these are the hypotheses. Okay, you can tell me later what you think, or you can tell me now. Lou, you look? I think so. You think it's just negative? Uh, because if you do a research result, for example, uh -huh. more manager than to do it like that. Because if, if everyone do it positive, you got to take a huge risk for being more in jail. <laughs> So in such a large sample, you'll have very few cases of cover-ups and fraud, and they wouldn't really affect the results. So just say negative relationship. That's what you're saying? Yeah. 
Okay, well, you know, he does both. He's covering his bases, right? That's okay. So if you can have competing hypotheses, it makes it easier to get a good result, right? All right. Firm size. So big firm, positive tone, or the opposite? He says, what does he say in the paper? Yeah, he says his, his best argument, I guess, is that large firms are more exposed. They should be more cautious. So negative. Okay, market to book ratio. So market to book. is related to investment opportunity and growth potential. And he says that firms with a higher MTB should have more uncertain future, which would have an, an uncertainty in this, later on in the paper, gets uh, attached to negativity. So. Negative. Volatility of operations. So high volatility, negative tone. Nothing else. That one. He doesn't. He doesn't make a guess here. So he just says some firms are complex. And this is how I'm measuring it. But he doesn't really guess. So I just said plus or minus. He, he doesn't know. Firm age, he said is negative. Um, I guess he's equating firm age with market to book ratio, with growth potential and investment opportunities. Okay, negative, I mean, uh, just firm events, just one time events. Uh, it says positive. Special items. He equates special items with unusual performance. And firms with more negative special items should have more MDNA, more negative MDNA tone. So more items, negative tone. I don't know about more positive items. He doesn't say. They incorporated in Delaware. Okay. So there are different laws in Delaware. So we're going to look at that also. Readability. Negative. Reporting quarter. They're just dummy variables, okay? So we're just seeing if there's an effect. Okay. He also hypothesizes that MDNA disclosures contain more information about the future profitability and liquidity of the company. They contain information. So, so MDNAs do have useful information. He believes there's a change in because of socks in the contents of the MDNA. And that MDNA disclosures affect how investors respond to information and rules. Okay. So those are the hypotheses. Now let's get back to the methodology. So we already talked about how to identify the forward-looking statements. Right? Now um, you <laughs> said the one good way to look at the tone of these statements is to just look for positive and negative words. That's one way. Yeah, one way. Maybe not good. That's one way. That's right. That is one way. Now, why didn't we just do that? Why didn't he do that? 
Well, here's an example. So what you're talking about are sometimes called word lists or dictionaries. So a list of words that are positive, a list of words that are negative. So available at that time, uh, there were yeah, a few of these lists. And one was called the General Inquirer. I, I think this might be the same as the Harvard word list. I'm not sure. But if you look at this example, um, this sentence, and uh, it's, it would be classified as a positive sentence based on the general inquirer dictionary because it has two positive words. So it says, in addition, the company has experienced attrition of its Medicare and commercial business in 1998 and 1999 and expects additional attrition. So that sounds like a very negative thing, the company shrinking. So why did it say it was positive? There are two positive words. What are the two positive words? Probably not attrition, but it could be, I can't remember, uh, like experience or expect. Those are probably the two positive words, okay? Because experience is a good thing, right? <laughs> okay. So instead he uses a naive Bayes approach to classifying the sentences as positive or negative. All right. Okay, so do you guys remember how he did this? The naive Bayes approach? What did, do you remember the steps? So here's what he did. So basically he identified about 13 million forward-looking statements. 13 million sentences in his corpus of MDNAs from the 10K and the 10Q that contain forward-looking statements, that contain one of these words, right? 13 million statements with sentences with one of these words. So what he does is he takes 30,000 randomly selected sentences. And he talks to, he has his students classify them as basically one of four things. Uh, positive, negative, neutral, or uncertain. Okay, so now you have 30,000 sentences that we, where we know the valence or the positivity or negativity, okay? Not only that, but he looks at the category of the sentence, whether it's uh, related to profit, uh, I can't remember the name of this category, and other okay, category, So he has these three categories, and look at that typo, category, what? Okay, that made it into a top journal. Always, it'll always be there. Okay. So what can you do with 30,000 sentences where you know the, that you know are positive or negative? How can you use this to determine whether the other 13 million are positive or negative? Any ideas? Sample. What's that? Sampling. Sampling? Like, what is that? It just, it's a good word to use. It seems appropriate. I just need more specifics. So sampling, like, do you want to expound? Or you don't have to. Be. Anyone else? All right. Well, this is like uh, this is like gets to like the one of the main ideas behind uh, classify classification using machine learning algorithms using artificial intelligence, right? So the idea is. If we have 30,000 sentences, and they all have certain words in them, okay, let's compare the other uh, 13 million sentences, minus 30,000, uh, to these 30,000, and whichever s sentences they're most similar to, we'll just say that they're positive or negative. So it does this in a little different way. So basically it says, Here's 30,000 sentences, back to 30,000 sentences. And here's the word may, okay? And the word may has like a 60% chance of appearing in a positive sentence. And a 40% chance of appearing 
in a negative sentence. So in this new sentence we haven't classified, has the word may in it, we're gonna say, we're gonna give that word may a 0.6, okay? And the next word is the word uh, caused. And caused is used in 60% uh, negative, 40% positive, okay? So here's how it goes. So the first thing that uh, Lee did was he split the sentences into lists of words, okay? And then he weights each word according to its frequency in the sentence, okay? He, he uh, removes the stock words. So um, anyone doing text mining uh, will need to just know some of these common things. So stock words are just common words. And maybe there's a list of 100 words or 150. You just, maybe you just don't want to analyze them because they just, they're just going to add noise. Okay, so he doesn't look at these words. He doesn't think that they have any bearing on whether a sentence is positive or negative. They're just function words. And then uh, here's another thing that he does is he stems the words. So a word stemming takes a word to its root. So if I have the word jump, jumped, jumping, jumper, okay, if you stem those words, they all go down. The root of each word is the word jump. So what he does is he stems words and he treats them all the same. Okay? So the word stop, stopping, stop, stopping, stop, they're all equal to stop. Okay. So in these 30,000 sentences, okay, he looks at the likelihood that a word will appear in a positive sentence or a negative sentence, okay? So classified as either positive or negative, okay? And let's say we have a sentence, a really short sentence that says, um, company, the company uh, failed, okay? And we want to use a naive Bayes approach to determine whether this is a positive or negative sentence. Now you know it's negative just by reading it. So what we're going to do is we're not going to look at the word the because that's a stop word. So we'll ignore this word. So we're going to first look at the word company. And in the positive sentences, let's see, here's the word company. So the word company, let's say, is used 45% uh, of the time in positive sentences, and 55% of the time it's used, it's in a negative sentence, okay? So it's not in 45% of the positive sentences, it's just 45% of the time it's used is in a positive sentence. And it failed. You know what, just for fun, Let's switch these around a little. So. so the word failed, 90% of the time it's used in a negative sentence. And 10% of the time in a positive sentence. So if you take, you have to do this twice now. So you say um, 0.65 times 0.1, that's like the positive score. 
the negative score would be 0.35 times 0.9. And this one is going to be greater. So you classify this as the greater of the two. So you classify this sentence as negative. Okay, so it's like a really simple uh, approach, right? So this is that formula. So you're taking the, you pick the category that has the maximum value of probability of one word given a category times the probability of another word given a category. Okay, you just, you take all the words in a sentence, multiply them together, all the probabilities together, you get a score, and the category with the highest score is the one you pick. All right. So he uh, was able to test the accuracy of his classifier. And um, he did a cross-validation approach, these like in-full cross-validation tests to test the accuracy. So basically what that means is if you have 30,000 sentences, okay, and you have a three-fold cross-validation test, does anyone know what that, what that means or should I just... Uh, basically, you're going to divide the data in three different ways. So, let's say um, here's 10,000, here's 10,000, and here's 10,000. Okay, so in a threefold uh, cross validation test, you yeah, have three groups. And the first test, you basically you build your model on these two, meaning you come up with your positive and negatives just on 20,000. And then you test the results on these 10,000. So these are like the 10,000 unknown sentences. We're pretending they're unknown. But we actually know what the outcome is. We know which ones are positive or negative. So now we can actually test if our classifier works or not because we know the outcome. So, so the first step in the threefold cross validation is we're going to train on two thirds of the sample, meaning we're going to come up with our prior probability for each word of being positive or negative based on these sentences. And then these sentences, we're going to uh, classify them based on the chart we built from these ones. Does that make sense? No? Nope. Yeah, can you explain it? Yeah, I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will explain it again. So, do you remember how I said before that we? You remember how I built this chart right here? Yeah. Where I said, uh, in these 30,000 sentences, uh, the word company was used in 65% of the time in positive sentences, or 35% of the time in negative sentences. You remember that, right? Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's pretend now we want to um, test the accuracy of of our classifier. You know, maybe everything's not as clear cut here. Maybe this was classified as positive, and so it means our classifier didn't work very well. Because company failed is definitely a negative sentence. So we're going to test how well the classifier works. So one way of doing that is dividing your um, your uh, your manually coded sample, or 30,000 sentences, divide it into little groups. And the reason that works so well is because 
in one of the in one group, we're not going to use we're not going to use this one to build our classifier. This is basically our classification model. This is our model we build. We're not going to use one group because you know if I took these thirty thousand sentences and I built this table for all the words, you know, fifty thousand different words, and then I used this table on a, one of these sentences, I'd probably get the answer right. You know, we'd probably classify it correctly because I'm testing the model on the training set, on the training data. This is like the training data. So if I, if I test the model on the training set, I'm gonna get really accurate results. I'm gonna classify it correctly almost every time. I don't know uh, how often. He didn't provide that data here. So. If you want to test the accuracy of your classifier, what you need to do is hold some of your sample out. Hold some of these 30,000 out to test on. So in this case, one thing we could do is we could just build the model off of 20,000. And these numbers might be a little different because we're not using all 30,000. So let's say company is now, instead of 65, it's 60, you know, 64.5%. And here, that would make this right there, okay? And fail, maybe, maybe, maybe that's what the numbers are if you just use 20,000 sentences. Okay. So you just use uh, the 20,000 and exclude the one. Uh -huh. I just use 20,000 and I exclude the 10,000. Okay. Then I can go ahead and say, well, we'll pretend that these are new sentences that we've never seen before. And we can do that because they're not in our, they're not the basis for the model. And we're going to classify them now as positive or negative based on these 20,000. And now, because we already know if these are positive or negative, uh, yeah. we can see how accurate the model is. Okay. So, so yeah. does that make sense? Yeah. So this is only the first step though. This is a three-fold cross-validation. So in the second step, we're going to do uh, we'll train on these 20,000 and we'll test on this, okay? So train, you know, test. Train, test. Okay, so we can then average our accuracy scores together. And then on the third one, obviously, because it's a threefold, let's just write it out. Then you have Yeah. This is train. This is text. So the nice thing is Every piece of the data is used to test on. You test every piece of the data based on the rest of the data. Any questions? Yeah. Do you Any? use a two, uh, 20,000 and get a probability and then use another 20,000 yeah. to, to map the test of whether they are matched? To test how well our model built from the yeah. 20,000 worked. Yeah, the probability of the, of the, from the 20,000 and it's matched away. So probability. Yeah, the probability of each word. Yeah. Yeah, multiplied together. So, okay, so here we have what's called, he has four categories of tone, positive, negative, neutral, uncertain, and the classification accuracy. And here, uh, three categories. So the accuracy should go up. So there's only three categories. I think it should. I guess it's good. Whatever. But here you combine uncertainty and negativity. Negativity, right? So there's only three categories. Uh, so negativity includes all the uncertainty sentences. Make sense, Lou? What he did? Yeah. Anyway. Um, so 60% accurate, 67% accurate. So here he, what he does is he he tests different cross validation models. For, so what would a, how would you do a five-fold cross-validation? 
Anything else? Or do? Yeah, four. So you divide the sample, you divide it into how many parts to start? Five parts. Yeah, five. So that would be how many sentences? Six thousand. Six thousand sentences, right. So you'd have five groups of sentences, six thousand yeah. in each group, yeah. and you always leave one out. So you do four, train on four, test on one. And here, there is a cross-validation called leave one out. So in that case, you only leave one out every time. So you train on 29,999 and you test on one. And you do it 30,000 times. Okay, but look, the results never change. <laughs> he gets about the same accuracy every time. They always go up, it seems. So up, 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 no, that didn't. But they trend up. Trend up. Okay. So informed guessing is just saying uh, it's just a completely naive approach. It's just based on the probabilities. Um, I can't quite remember exactly how he did it, but he's just not doing any learning. Yeah. How did he decide how many um, tests should, or how many sets should be cross validated? Yeah, he just is just testing different things out. So how many? You mean the n? What n should be? Yeah, yeah. He's just testing out to see if it makes a difference. So does it make a difference if we do three sets or fifty sets? And it didn't make a big difference. All right. Any questions about that? It's like a pretty common technique when we're doing classification algorithms. It doesn't have to be naive based. It can be discriminant analysis. It can be decision tree. It can be neural network. You can do a cross-validation test. Yeah. Do I usually in literature use tenfold? Yeah, ten. So ten is like a common one. It's just a common... It's some theoretical basis. I don't... Just, yeah. <laughs> I think this pretty clearly establishes that as you go up, you don't get very much improved results. So tenfold cross-validation is what I see a lot as well. Divide the sample in ten. And train on ten, nine. That's something. All right. I always lose my picker. Usually it's over here every time. Okay. So in this case, he had the three categories. So one was positive, zero neutral, negative one was negative or uncertain. Okay, those were the scores assigned. Oh, okay. So here we are. Once we've identified whether a sentence is positive or negative, now we have to assign a tone to the mDNA itself, which could have 100 sentences that are forward-looking. So what he does is he takes the average scores of each of the sentences. So if you have 100 sentences, and let's say uh, 20 are positive, uh, 50 are negative, and 30 are neutral, then you would have a score of uh, negative 50 divided by 100. Or wait, how many positive? 20. So it would be about negative 30 divided by 100. So negative 0.3 would be the score. Make sense? Yeah. All right. So here are some descriptive statistics. Profit, liquidity, and other, those are the three categories. All right, so the average tone of the MDNH, negative two. So there are more negative forward looking statements than positive. All right, so you guys, I, I found this graph really interesting. So tone is mean reverting. So do you guys 
remember this one? Do you, can any of you explain it to me? I'll ask the camera. <laughs> Anyone? So basically, no one can off the top of your head. I won't make you like read it. So basically, what he did was he divided the, all the companies into quintiles, so into five, based on their tone for one quarter. I guess it was the first quarter of his analysis. And he looked in the top quintile, you had the most positive companies, the top 20% positive companies. And the bottom one, the bottom 20%, most negative, okay? So the most positive companies had an average tone, uh, like positive tone of like 0.18 or something like that. And the most negative companies were like at points, negative 0.62, okay? So across the bottom, so this, these are those same 20% of companies over time. Each line is one set of companies over time. Okay? So across the bottom, we have a, the number of quarters after the initial measurement. Okay? So this is five years, 20 quarters. So over time, their tone goes back toward the mean, and which was point, negative 0.23 anyway the mean for all of them. So all of them go to approach negative point. So tone is mean reverting. That's all this is. Which I think is interesting. Okay. So here are the results on the determinants of the tone. So current firm performance positive relationship. Rule is negative. Hey, that's what you said. You were adamant about that. Firm size negative. So, any surprises here? No big surprises. Very good job for Dr. Lee. Here's interesting. So, the relationship between tone and future earnings. Okay. So, what this is saying is. Anyone want to say what this is saying? There is a positive relationship between tone. Let's say my tone uh, in my company in 2015 predicts my earnings in the next year or quarter. Okay, so these are quarters. So one quarter away from a measurement of tone. Uh, has this is, is a significant relationship, okay? Two quarters away, it's still significant. So six months later. Three quarters away, it's still significant, but it's getting less and less so. One year later, it's not significant anymore, okay? You can't predict tone. Those are his results. You can't predict earnings based on tone from a year ago. Yeah, for future, it's okay, but for current, just as I mentioned, I don't need this. Yeah, okay. This yeah, okay. could affect each other. Uh -huh. We couldn't say they have a product. Yeah, so but for the future... Yeah, for future, it's, it's okay. Yeah. At least, uh, yeah, Mercer is okay. <laughs> yeah, if so. they don't orbit somewhere. Great. Okay, so another thing that... Uh, Thing Lee did was he looked at his analysis compared to what he, what are the results he would have gotten had he used these general psycho, psychosocial dictionaries, um, these psychology based dictionaries of positive and negative. You know the ones that he decided not to use in the beginning, um, and he found this correlation between. Uh, tone and earnings. So the highest correlation, highest positive correlation, is between his measured tone and earnings. So here's a different dictionary from call it from a tool called Diction. Here's the General Inquirer dictionary, and here's the Loop or the Linguistic Inquiry and Word Count dictionary. 
positivity and negativity. So the, the most positive correlation was between his measure of tone and ours. And this is uh, the fog index, the measure of readability. So readability is like uh, basically saying how complex the sentences are on average. So if you have words that are very complex, and the way they the way you measure complex words is like number of word letters or number of syllables, or you can look also at the length of sentences. So if you have complex sentences, you have low readability. Or you might even say a high readability, it depends how it's written. So high readability score high readability scores could mean you need a high education in order to understand or something like that. Anyway, this is one way to measure, one index, one measure of readability is this, this gunning fog score. And here, um, you have in the highest, the, the biggest correlation, and it's negative, is between his measure of tone and fog. So uh, I guess that means the higher score, the higher score means it's less readable. So the less readable, or I don't know how we sing this. I guess it makes sense to say more negative and the more complex, which would be lower readability, but a higher score. I'm not sure how the fog score is calibrated, whether a high score means more or less readable. But I think this is saying, and maybe one of you can look this up. I think this is saying low, uh, very, <laughs> see a positive tone means it, Cor is correlated with the low, uh, lower readability score. I think that's what that means. Positive tone, lower readability. I, I, I honestly don't even know what to expect here. Any of you look it up for me? Is that what that means? That a high, re a high readability would have, yeah, I, I, I honestly can't even say it. I don't know what it's saying. I don't know what this means. Okay, I didn't read the paper in that much detail. Okay. Can one of you look it up and interpret this for me? I'll look as well. higher the index, the lower the, the, lower the readability. So, if the tone is positive, positive it's higher then you have lower, lower index. index. Yeah, higher. yeah, so that, that, that makes sense with what I was thinking then. So, positive tone, like a 1, is negatively negatively correlated with fog. So when this is a one, this is more like a low number also, which would actually be like a one, which is a low score. So it's, but it's more readable. So shorter sentences, shorter words. I don't know what else fog takes into account. Maybe the number of syllables, which is almost the exact same as the length of a word, very highly correlated. Okay. You guys have any comments on the paper? You like this paper? You think it has any strengths or weaknesses? Yeah, I just mentioned the weak guys. Oh. Yeah. Okay. You know, one. Go ahead. It, uh, the, the paper is uh, very complicated, <coughs> but uh, I'm curious about uh, how to use the result of the paper. How to use the results of the paper? Well, like you might say. plan or predict. What's that? Like, uh, you could plan something or predict something. Plan something or predict something? Uh, you could plan something. I guess the purpose of the paper is to say, um, well, if you need to determine whether or not there is information content in the forward-looking statements or in the MDNA, are these MDNAs informative? 
based on a measure of tone, his answer is yes. So he's saying in the future, you might build a tool that measures the tone of the mDNA. You know, he the way we work in research, we do something once, maybe, but it's not ready for production. It's not ready for a corporate environment. But now they can maybe maybe the big institutional investors or some enterprising software developer could automate this process and say, yeah, here's the tone of the MDNA. You can use this for investment decision or something like that. He uh, provides some evidence to say it's an informative. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so what I think is a strength of this paper is this method, this naive Bayes methodology for determining the tone of all these sentences. But it's also related to the weakness of the paper, I think. Or not, a weak, but an opportunity presented by the paper to come up with a list of words besides the general inquirer, the diction, or the loop, you know, these general positive lists of positive and negative words. There's an opportunity to come up with a list of words meant for financial disclosures. So what are all the what are the positive words in the MDNA or the 10K? What are the negative words? And maybe that would be even more helpful in determining the tone of the MDNA or any part of the 10K or any other documents that are similar to those. And that's what our next paper is about. And we're gonna take a break before we get into this. Let's see. So it is four, about four o'clock, and we get out of class at five twenty. Yeah. All right. We're gonna do something before the break, okay? You guys, it's it's good. What we're gonna do? We're gonna skip ahead, and I'm gonna give you guys a worksheet to work on that you can do during the break. But it'll make your break longer because I'll expect you to be doing the worksheet and taking a break. Okay? All right. So I'm going to skip ahead to like the end of this presentation. And I really like like to do text mining research. You need to be familiar with what tool, what's possible, what tools are available. The the best way to think about it is, you know, if you want to measure something, it's, it's possible. It's maybe it's not a great measurement, but you can do it, right? So, one way to uh, identify things in text, like text mining is a lot about counting the number of times things happen in the text, right? So how many times do you see a positive word? Or how many times do you see a negative word? Or how many times do you see a word that starts a certain way? Or how many times can you find a, no, a phone number? Or an email address? Or a certain name? Or a certain number within a certain range? Okay, all that stuff. Very easy to do if you understand. Uh, when, whenever you're matching, looking for things in text, then what, fundamentally, um, the tool to do this is called regular expressions, okay? Do, do any of you know regular expressions? You do, right, Dan? You're getting good at them, right? Yeah. So, you're all young. I learned regular expressions in my PhD program. I started my second year in my PhD program. And now, I'm a lot better at them. You know, I'm not perfect. But, uh, so this is what they are. So, regular expressions match words, numbers, etc. Let's say I'm in the 10K, all right? And you know the 10K is very structured, if you've read one. And it might have, you might have item seven, which is the MDNA, and you might have item eight, okay? And you wanna capture everything between item seven and item eight, so that you can extract the MDNA from the file and do your, whatever you're gonna do with it. Do your text mining or whatever. So one way to do that is using regular expressions. You can say, I want to find item seven and everything after it up until I see the word item eight. 
And when, you, when I find that, I want to stick it in a text file, okay? You can do that with a little bit of programming. Of course, it's not that simple, but more or less you can do that. So, what else? Okay, so yeah, I use regular expressions for document parsing. Again, uses regular expressions to find items in a contract. So contracts have, if uh, this one company is, has like 10,000 contracts, maybe they all look the same and they have the same, this is like an insurance contract and they all talk about liabilities in the exact same way, the exact same uh, title for each item that's covered in the insurance contract. Well, I could write a little program that searches for all these titles, looks for the number that comes after them and throw it all into a, an Excel spreadsheet so I can do my analysis. Okay, that's what we did, right? With yes. the contracts. Okay, so I'm gonna teach you guys regular expressions. So it's so easy, okay? I'm gonna talk in superlatives like, like Donald Trump does, you know? <laughs> it's so easy, this is the best thing you're gonna do in your life ever. Okay, so here's a regular expression, A. Just the A, not the quotes, just the A. So A, matches A. So in, uh, in a Word document, in like Microsoft Word, if you're looking for a word, you can use the find function. That's kind of like regular expressions, okay? So if you search for an A, it'll show you all the A's. Okay. Now, AB matches AB. Of course, just AB, nothing else, just AB. And this just matches A, nothing else. But you, what you can do is you can throw in some uh, regular expression, what do they call them? Qualifiers or special characters, like the star. And the star means zero or one of the previous, well, what comes previous, okay? So A is your regular expression so that matches A. A star matches nothing. So it matches one A, or it matches infinite A's in a row. A plus sign is like a star. It means one or many, one or more, okay? So A star matches one A, two A's, but not nothing. So that's the difference between A star and A plus. Everyone following along so far? See how easy? Now the parentheses sort of group an expression together so that the modifier afterwards applies to both. So AB star would match nothing, zero or one AB, zero or many ABs. So nothing, AB, 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 but it doesn't match ABA because it has to be AB, okay? So a dot is a special regular expression that matches anything, okay? It matches a dot, it matches a letter, a number, it matches anything. Now these are case sensitive, just so you know. So lowercase a matches lowercase a. Uh, slash W is another special character that means it matches any letter or number. Capital, lowercase, letter, and any number. But it doesn't match any symbols, like a percentage symbol, dollar sign, a hyphen or dash, wouldn't match that. It doesn't match a space. Okay, a space is a character also. W does not match a space but a period does match space. All right, so here we are combining, writing a long regular expression. All right, so slash W plus ampersand, no not ampersand, at symbol, a row, that's, I know the Spanish word. For slash W plus Slash period, okay. 
So you know how this period matches anything? What if you wanted to just match the period? Then you can what's called escape it. So you put a slash in front of the period. Now it just matches the period. Okay, and then C O M. So here, slash W plus matches K MOF, right? Then the at symbol matches this. Then slash W plus again matches email. Then a dot. Then com. But it does not match this because the way you would do this, you say slash W plus matches K. Then it's at does not match this, so it breaks. Okay. Here's a phone number. Yeah, I don't even know how well this is done. Basically, um, so this question mark here. Okay, so first let's start from the beginning. So slash parenthesis. So remember the parenthesis was used just to group together the letters. If you want to actually match parentheses, you got to put a slash in front. Okay. And so sometimes a slash, like with a slash W, it makes it special to match anything. And sometimes a slash you put in front of it makes it normal. Like a slash period makes it match a period. But a W matches W, but a slash W matches all this stuff. Any number or letter. Okay. So phone numbers. So this question mark means zero or one. So slash parenthesis question mark means zero or one opening parenthesis. All right. Now here we have another question mark means zero or one. So here this this slash d mean only matches numbers. Okay. So slash w matches numbers and letters. Slash d only matches numbers. And I believe slash capital W is the inverse of slash lowercase w. And the same with slash capital D. So this three in curly brace brackets means three numbers. So it's like the area code. And so here you have a slash D with another three. So that's the first part of a phone number. And here you have a hyphen or dash. Okay, another slash D with a four, four numbers. So actually I could write a better regular expression for phone numbers. But this more or less matches area code with or without parentheses. Then three digits or um, then a dash, then four digits. Here's an optional dash right here. Makes sense mostly, right? Edward? You know what, you'll practice, you'll get to practice. So this is like a credit card number, a Visa credit card number. So this carrot in the front means it starts with a four. Okay, so in the brackets here, it says zero to nine. So what this means, it can be any number from 0 to 9. Inside the square brackets, it's like a big OR. So you start with a 4, and then you can have any number from 0 to 9. And you can have 12 of them. So it could be a 0, 4, 8, 9, and then 12 numbers, OK? <coughs> Excuse me. So that's 13 numbers. Then, I believe this is some sort of uh, a look. So, this is some sort of a look ahead statement or look, look behind. So, it's basically saying it has to start with a four has to have 12 numbers later, and has to end with three numbers, okay? This is kind of a complex one. So that gets to the 16 numbers. Okay, American Express, there's a different one for American Express. Okay, 
So there's a couple other I needed to show you on the board before you can do this action. So um, so this this right here. Say it says A B or B A. A B or B A. That would match that would match this and it would also match this. Okay? A B or B. Remember how this is or? So like, I could put A to Z here. <clears throat> this would be all lowercase letters. Any one lowercase letter. So it would match A or B or C. Or if I put a star by it, it would match lots of letters, right? Now if I did this, caret A, this would match everything except an A. It would match. One, two, three, match low, uppercase, all uppercase letters, every lowercase letters except A, every symbol. Okay, here's another one. Uh, okay, so slash S matches a space. Give you each a worksheet. 